remain standing, open your Bibles to <coughs> Romans chapter 3. <coughs> we'll begin reading with verse 21, read to the end of the chapter. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and are falling short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood, through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, He passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time, so that He would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. Thus far, God's holy word. Please be seated. In all great works, there is much more that goes on behind the scene than what we see. That's true with meals or artistic developments, plays or books or whatever. But it's also true of... Uh, people doing specific things, working out certain purposes. Think of the investor who has decided to invest in a, a certain uh, investment. Maybe it's a, a gold mine or an oil uh, well or development. Now, he has a purpose in doing that that's more obvious, and that purpose will be that he will want to further his estate. And so he makes these investments. But we also know with, with wise investors that there's a complexity of purposes working under the surface. It might be a particular investment that will also become for him uh, a tax uh, shelter. And he'll be able to uh, uh, keep more of his money for himself. It might be that he uh, wants to lay up uh, an inheritance for his grandchildren. And so that's a purpose working behind his purpose. Or more importantly, it might be, and. Uh, he, he wants to have more money to give to the, the causes of the Lord. And so he's got an express purpose, but behind it are these other purposes. It's the same with children. Sometimes, children, we give you a chore to do to help mommy or daddy, and that's a help. But also, because we know your character, we might have other purposes. Maybe we want to stretch you. And we want to take you beyond what you think you can do. When our son was in middle school, I sent him for a summer to Mississippi to hoe cotton. Um, yeah, he made some money for the summer, but I had other purposes. He lived with a very close family, friend of ours, Christian family. And he was stretched that he, he wouldn't be soft, that he, he would be firmed up. And so this is true in our affairs. It's all the more true with the Lord God. In the complexity of His purpose, all we ever really see are the fringes of the ways of God. Perhaps as you looked at the eclipse, and when it went to full eclipse, and you took your glasses away, and there was that corona, and it was beautiful, it was startling, shouted. Uh, but we just saw the corona of the sun, and it was beautiful, but we couldn't look at the entirety of the sun. And so often God's works are the corona of his being. And that's certainly true with respect to uh, this doctrine that we've been examining of justification by faith alone. Now we know that Paul lays out the doctrine to show us that God has provided a way of escape 
for sinners. And so after having indicted the entire human race, he then, in the section we examined last week, sets before us the doctrine of free justification. That it is the gift of imputed righteousness, purchased by Christ, received by faith alone. And even as we unpack that, we can see something of the complexity of it. But behind the scenes, so to speak, there are other things operating in the wisdom of God. And now, in this concluding paragraph of chapter 3, Paul works those things out. He's showing us some of the purposes, so to speak, behind the scenes of the scheme of free justification. And that's what I want us to look at this morning. I want to show you that free justification exalts the glory of God, the character of God, and the law of God. Free justification exalts the glory of God, the character of God, and the law of God. And we'll, we'll break it out in those three purposes that it exalts the glory of God, it exalts the character of God, and the law of God. And Paul does this with a series of rhetorical questions. So we see in verses 27 and 28 that free justification exalts the glory of God. After having established that justification uh, is a just act on God's part uh, at the end of verse 26, uh, Paul then asks this first question, where then is boasting? He says, if justification is free, purchased by Christ, received by faith alone, what are the grounds for self-congratulations? Are there any grounds for a sinner taking anything to himself, of thinking that he can contribute anything to God with respect, for, with respect to his salvation? Are there any grounds at all for boasting in the scheme that Paul has revealed? And Paul says, answers his own question, it is excluded. It's a very simple once and for all activity. All grounds of boasting are nullified. They are wiped away simply by this system of free justification. Why? What is at work here? Well, he asks another series of questions. By what kind of law? Now, in the book of Romans, particularly here and in chapter 7, Paul uses this word law in many different ways. He's already talked about trying to be justified by law keeping. He's talked about law as uh, scripture. And here he's using law as a principle. So when he says by what kind of law, he's not saying is there some statute that does away with boasting. No, he says what's the principle at work here? Oh, what are the rules by which God is operating? By what kind of law? Of works? That's the first option. That's the option of Paul's contemporaries. That was the option of present day Judaism in Paul's day. And so by works of the law, by uh, the ceremonies of the law, the sacraments of the law, by the keeping of the law, for the Jews had taken uh, the Mosaic uh, economy and turned it into a purely legal economy that they could earn God's favor. But Paul has established that's impossible. So is boasting excluded by works of the law? Well obviously it can't be. If I can get into God's favor by what I do or with whom I join or what is done to me sacramentally then there can be some grounds for boasting. But of course the answer to his question is no, but by a law of faith. The faith that he's laid out in the previous paragraph. The faith that we described last week that consists of uh, knowledge, assent, and trust by this way provided by God in which a sinner simply cast himself on uh, the mercy of God revealed in Christ Jesus and receives uh, not only pardon for his sins, but is constituted legally righteous in the sight of God. In that scheme, says Paul, is there any ground for boasting? Well, of course not. And he confirms that then in verse 28. We maintain, we reason, we hold to the fact that a man, using the word generically here, a person, is justified by faith, asserting again the central doctrine 
apart from works of the law. He simply is summarizing that there is no way that any individual contributes in any way to his acceptance with God. This gets back to the purpose behind the purpose. The great purpose of God's salvation from beginning to end is not getting us out of hell. The great purpose is God's glory. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as Paul is having to address the pride behind the schisms, the cliques in Corinth, he focuses on sovereign grace and he sets out election. And he says in verse 29, So that no man may boast before God, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, both righteousness and sanctification and redemption, and here he quotes Jeremiah 9, so that just as it is written, let him who boast, boast in the Lord. You see, this method of salvation, free justification received by faith, destroys human pride and lifts up the glory of God so that we are abased before him and he is exalted in our own estimation, in his own declaration, in all of his works, he is the one that is glorious. And so there is a place for boasting, says Paul. But it's not in us, you see. We're to be humbled. Most of you are well aware of the plague of pride. It clings to us like dust on a hot, dusty day. And we wrestle with it. And we often are overcome with it. And it's often the subtle mover behind our own acts and activities and our self-assessment. And time and again, the Bible warns us that God hates the proud. He abases the proud. He exalts the humble. God tells us not to think too highly of ourselves, to think more highly of the brethren. And it says you realize the absolute sovereignty of God's grace and the scheme of salvation, your pride should daily be broken. Daggers into the heart of pride from the realization of a free, gracious salvation and a lifting up of an estimation of the glory of God. The more you boast in God, the lower thoughts you will have of yourself. The more you boast in God, the less concern you will be about yourself and your reputation and who's asking you to do what. And so free justification exalts the glory of God, teaches us ourselves to boast in Him. But second, free justification exalts the character of God. And Paul asserts this with the questions in verses 29 and 30. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is He not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Now, as Paul is addressing his audience here, and he's thinking about the Jewish attitude, they've got an inside track, they've got a, a corner of God's favor. And, you know, it's, it's easy to understand why they thought that way, because for 1,200 years they had been the objects of the administration of God's covenant. His dealings had kept much within the boundaries of the, uh, the nation church that he had established in the Mosaic covenant. And um, Christ himself says to the woman at the well in Samaria that salvation is of the Jews, that one would have to come to God uh, through uh, the Jewish system, the sacrifices, and the priest, and, and have the oracles. So it's not surprising that they thought that they had this one-way street, that they were superior to Gentiles. But Paul has just asserted a doctrine, justification received by faith alone. He says there is no distinction. Now what's he talking about, remember? There's no distinction between Jew and Gentile, between moral and immoral, between um, uh, pagan uh, barbarian or civilized person. There's no distinction. So he says, is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not? Puts it a question that needs a pause. Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Now see, even in the Old Testament, this was intimated. 
Ezekiel 47 talks about the Gentiles being brought into Israel and given an inheritance in the midst of the people. Malachi concludes the Old Testament with this great statement in verse 11. For from the rising of the sun even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense is going to be offered to my name, and a grain offering that's pure. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. That should have been the expectation of the Jews, you see. They should have been pressing and, and longing to see the the tents of Shem opened up to Japheth. That was part of their covenant heritage. It was part of God's revelation. But they had become ethnocentric. They had uh, focused simply in on themselves. They couldn't care less about the Gentiles. They despised the Gentiles. And so Paul says what we really learn uh, from this justification by faith alone, that God is now expanding His covenant administration from the nation to the nations. No longer is it going to be restricted to the place of Jerusalem, to a temple, to those sacrifices, because the one sacrifice, as we see in the preceding paragraph, has been accomplished. Redemption has been paid. Propitiation in His blood has been accomplished. And now the gates are flung wide open. The tent pegs are lifted up. And in comes the Gentiles. In comes Japheth. That has always been God's purpose. And Paul is seeking to disabuse the Jews of their self-centeredness. And again, he grounds it. Now this time he grounds it in his character. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Now it's very interesting. He takes this doctrine, the key doctrine of Judaism, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They exalted in their monotheistic religion. They exalted in the oneness of God. And that's what Paul uses now to show that it's the oneness of God that's at operation here behind the great scheme of justification in which there's no distinction. Now, there's a bit of an irony, I think, in his language. He changes the preposition. Um, he says, God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. Uh, the, I think he just simply changed the preposition. They're really synonyms. He uses them interchangeably. But again, just to focus on the fact there really is no difference. How did you come to the seminary today? Did you come by a car or did you come in an automobile? No difference in the preposition. There's no difference here. Paul says we all, he, he asserts the same thing in Galatians chapter 2, that, that Jews had to be saved by faith. And here he asserts it again, but notice now what stands behind it is the oneness of God. Because one God means one purpose. One eternal purpose. And they weren't going that next step, you see. One God, yes, but they weren't looking at the one eternal purpose. The one decree of God that sovereignly had, in a sense, locked in on a Jewish people primarily for 1,200 years, but because it was one plan, already intimated often in the old covenant promises of the universality of uh, the church, of offerings made to God in all places, of Gentiles even being incorporated, uh, of God planting synagogues throughout the Roman Empire as a part of the means unto that end. There was one holy eternal purpose because one God has but one purpose. And again we see the beautiful eternal decree of sovereign grace. And any explication of that decree that speaks contrary to the outworking of the decree. That God has a universal desire that all be saved. Or that God first uh, had Christ die for all and then would send Christ, uh, the Holy Spirit, to, uh, to regenerate uh, the elect. There's no division in God's decree. There's no bifurcation. He's one God and He always had, had one purpose. And that is from this acorn planted in Genesis 3.15 right to Revelation chapter 22 to bring about the salvation of his elect unto the ends of the earth that he might demonstrate his character as well. You know, we're not Jews. 
but we can become very ethnocentric, can't we? The church can become very ingrown. We can become very concerned about our own little needs, and we forget about those around us, and we forget that the one God has a one purpose, and that purpose he's entrusted to his church, is that we're to take the gospel to our neighborhood and unto the ends of the earth. The oneness of God, the oneness of God's purpose with the means attached to that purpose of worldwide evangelism becomes to you and me and to our churches a mandate then to declare this wonderful gospel that justification is by faith alone. But there's one more thing uh, that Paul deals with here. He has uh, exalted the glory of God that we might glory in God, not ourselves. He's exalted the the oneness of God and His purpose that we might recognize the universal and sovereign implications of the gospel. But he also, now to the heart of the issue, he exalts the law of God. Now Paul asks a question in verse 31 that he's dealt with and will deal with a good bit. Do we then nullify the law through faith? That's, that's what the Jews thought because they had taken the Mosaic Covenant there was a covenant of grace with a legal administration and had stripped away the grace and it focused on a legal administration. And thus Paul's negative comments about the law have to always be addressed to their abuse of the law. And as he has leveled the law as a means of acceptance with God, then they could come to the conclusion, well, then the law is passed away. If that covenant administration is gone, law is gone. And that's the question he's saying here. Does faith abrogate law? Does faith nullify the law of God? And of course he has that strong asservation, may it never be. It's not a very good translation, but I love the King James, God forbid. God forbid, this can't happen. On the contrary, we establish the law. Now, Paul is saying here the doctrine of just, free justification actually establishes the law. Now, in what way? In the first place, through the Mosaic Covenant, through the republication, I'll go ahead and use the word, of the covenant of works within it, that is how Christ fulfilled the covenant of works. He fulfilled all the law. He kept every jot and tittle of the law. And then he paid the sanction of the law because curse is any man that hangs on a tree. He took the curse of his people upon himself. And that's why Paul will say in Romans 10.4 then, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. He accomplished this righteousness that the law demanded. There's no way to be saved apart from perfect law keeping. Use that in your evangelism. There's no way you can be right with God apart from perfect law keeping. And you can't do it, can you? But there's one who did. There's one who met all the demands of this covenant. He is the end of the law for righteousness. He's accomplished the righteousness of the law that it might become ours in Him by this gift, this imputation of justification. Thus, he enables us now to keep the law. Because he's the end of the law, because he met the legal demands of the law, he then has removed uh, the condemnation of the law and the bondage of the law and that irritating factor of the law that actually would stir up sin within us because of our flesh. Wipe those things away so that we now are free. Free to do what? We are free to obey. <laughs> Not on a treadmill seeking self-acceptance. Not in some way to make ourselves uh, worthy of God. No, we are free with glad-hearted obedience of gratitude to serve God according to His law. So you see how faith establishes the law? Away then with this modern antinomianism that we have in our Reformed churches of hyper-grace. No, justification is a means to an end. It's a means, yes, to acceptance, but it's the first step to all the other things that are part of Christian living. It's the freedom to obey God. And thus, 
Law and gospel are not enemies. They're friends. Law is the handmaiden of the gospel. And the gospel frees us to keep the law. Do you love the law of God? All of it. All of his moral precepts. All of the precision of the law of God. Or do you still quaff against it? And do you and want to push back on this commandment? Or the one that goes to your heart? Or to your affections? Or to your resources? Or your stewardship? You've been freed to love the law of God. It's no longer a bondage. It's no longer a cruel taskmaster saying, do this and live. No, it says Christ did this that you can live. And you can love the God. Now the life you have is the abundant life of Christ Jesus. Yes, of obedience. And the full life that comes to those by grace who in Christ Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit keep the law of God. And so Paul parts the curtains and we look behind the scene. The complexity, the wisdom of our God who in this great scheme of free acceptance through justification purchased by Christ, received by faith alone, God is doing many other things. He is exalting His glory. He is exalting His character. He is exalting His law. And thus we are to be mindful of the mysteries of God's ways that we only ever will see the fringes. And we should revel in those fringes. But we should never put God in a box. We should recognize that uh, in all of His ways, yes, in the, the accomplishment of redemption, but in all acts of providence, in hurricanes and floods, there is a complexity of purposes behind what we see. And we look for them through Scripture. And whatever we see, we then are better fitted to be filled with wonder and praise and awe at our God who is altogether wise and glorious. And then again I remind you this is the gospel with which you are being entrusted for which most of you are training yourselves to be <coughs> ministers of this gospel. Yes, to proclaim this great method of acceptance with God, but knowing that what you're really doing is opening up to men and women, boys and girls, a little bit at a time of the glory of God. And that we'll see a bit more day after day and year after day, year after year, until we shall see Him in something of His full glory through Christ Jesus in the great beatific vision of heaven. So praise your God for the complexity of his purposes and the incomprehensibility of his ways and come to the conclusion as Paul does after he discusses salvation by grace for of him and through him and for him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Father we thank you for these consequences, these scenes behind the scene, the complex complexity of God's purposes that we can trace out from the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Oh Lord, help us to love you all the more and to revel all the more in the greatness of Christ, the greatness of the triune God, the wisdom of your unified purpose and to rest there and to look as we can with the lenses of Scripture into the complexity of your purposes and to proclaim your glory by how we live and act and in our teaching and preaching. And we ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.